NASA's Themis mission has overturned a long-standing belief about the interaction between solar particles and the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field is like a giant farm magnet. This magnet forms a protective field around the Earth, shielding us from the solar wind that is constantly streaming towards Earth. This shield is called the magnetosphere. The solar wind is primarily composed of protons and electrons, charged particles streaming out from the sun. Some of those particles have very high energies, radiation energies, and they can damage astronauts and spacecraft. We are shielded by our Earth's magnetic field most of the time. However, a small fraction of the solar wind particles get into the Earth's magnetic field, are energized, and become the Earth's radiation belts, which can damage spacecraft and harm astronauts. But the sun has a magnetic field of its own as well, which the solar wind carries outwards towards Earth. And the Themis spacecraft fleet recently observed that 20 times more solar particles get into the Earth's magnetosphere when the sun's magnetic field aligns with that of the Earth than when they're pointed in opposite directions. In the past, researchers found that the energy from the sun gets into the Earth's magnetic field during periods when the sun's magnetic field points southward. Here we found that the particles get in, the plasma, the particles from the sun, get into the Earth's magnetic field when the sun's magnetic field points northward. For a long time, people have known that the location where particles and energy get into the Earth's magnetic field depend on the orientation of the sun's magnetic fields, but they just hadn't realized how many particles get in for the northward orientation of the sun's magnetic field. So what do these new findings mean for us here on Earth? Well, with this new information, scientists can make better predictions about when solar storms will be severe. Meaning, we can better prepare for the power outages, satellite damage, and other problems that these storms can often cause. Earth's magnetic fields may be causing bird and fish die-off. Could the Earth's magnetic fields be causing the recent die-off of thousands of birds and fish? Scientists believe so, along with environmental imbalances. The sudden death of thousands of blackbirds in Arkansas over the 2010 to 2011 New Year's holiday last weekend was newsworthy enough. Within a couple of days, hundreds of stories from all around the globe recounted similar phenomena. Not only have blackbirds been falling out of the sky, but many species of birds, as well as reported cases of bat deaths in Arizona. In addition, there are numerous reports being gathered from around the world about massive fish die-off and die-off of many different sea animals. What could be causing these deaths? Some researchers believe that changes in the Earth's magnetic fields are to blame. The Earth's magnetic fields, what they are and how birds use them to migrate. The Earth's magnetic field is similar to that of a bar magnet with north and south poles. The magnetic field causes a bubble around the Earth which protects it from solar winds, asteroids, and other objects in space. Scientists believe the magnetic poles are due to electric currents that come from the Earth's core. The circulating electric current creates a dynamo effect, which is caused, in part, by the rotation of the Earth's axis. A dynamo effect is similar to what happens with an electric generator. When the magnetic field interacts with particles from solar winds, it creates what is known as the aurora borealis near the poles. Scientists at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, have discovered that a bird can see the Earth's magnetic fields through photoreceptor cells in the bird's right eye. Birds use this navigational tool to migrate north and south during the autumn and spring. Before this discovery, it was believed that birds could sense the magnetic field either through their eyes or beaks. These photoreceptor cells create shades of light which tell the birds if they are on or off course during migration. Could the Earth's magnetic fields be causing the die-off of thousands of birds? The Goethe Universität study revealed that if birds could not see the magnetic field when migrating, they lost their bearings and could hurt themselves or even die. NASA reported in 2008 that there was a massive breach in the Earth's magnetic field detected by Themis spacecraft. Solar wind can flow through this breach, causing enormous geomagnetic storms. It is very possible that such a geomagnetic storm is responsible for the current deaths of thousands of birds across the planet. Magnetic storms can cause many different phenomena to occur. Not only do birds, such as the reported blackbirds, 
pelicans, penguins and eagles lose their bearings and fall dead from exhaustion and hunger, but radio transmissions can be lost. There can be radiation from too much solar power, and high-energy charged particles can bombard the Earth due to the breach in the magnetic shield wrapping the planet. Magnetic storms can also trigger changes in the Earth's crust, which may lead to increases in landslides, mudslides, earthquakes, and volcano eruptions. What about the fish kills? Are the fish and bird die-offs related? It may be possible that the fish and bird die-offs are unrelated. Arkansas Game and Fish Commission spokesman Keith Stevens believes that in the drumfish case, it could just be a disease, since it only affected one species. He says fish kills are not unusual. However, fish kills are being reported all across the world. Panama reports at least 100 tons of several species of fish found dead all along its coast. Officials there suspect an environmental imbalance, possibly due to the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Italy claims a massacre of fish, clams, and crabs over Christmas, but blame nearby industries. Similar fish kills are being reported in other cities. According to ScienceDaily.com, sea creatures such as sharks, crabs, salmon, and sea turtles not only use magnetic fields to navigate, but also to detect their prey, so it is entirely possible that some of the recent deaths of not only fish, but sea animals like starfish and dolphins are due to changes in the Earth's magnetic fields. A Giant Breach in Earth's Magnetic Field Presented by Science at NASA December 16, 2008 NASA's five Themis spacecraft have discovered a breach in Earth's magnetic field ten times larger than anything previously thought to exist. Solar wind can flow in through the opening to load up the magnetosphere for powerful geomagnetic storms. But the breach itself is not the biggest surprise. Researchers are even more amazed at the strange and unexpected way it forms, overturning long-held ideas of space physics. At first, I couldn't believe it, says Themis project scientist David Seibeck of the Goddard Space Flight Center. This finding fundamentally alters our understanding of the solar wind-magnetosphere interaction. The magnetosphere is a bubble of magnetism that surrounds Earth and protects us from solar wind. Exploring the bubble is a key goal of the Themis mission, launched in February 2007. The big discovery came on June 3rd of the same year when the five probes serendipitously flew through the breach just as it was opening. Onboard sensors recorded a torrent of solar wind particles streaming into the magnetosphere, signaling an event of unexpected size and importance. The opening was huge, four times wider than Earth itself, says Wen Hu Li, a space physicist at the University of New Hampshire who has been analyzing the data. Lee's colleague, Jimmy Rader, also of New Hampshire, says 10 to the 27 particles per second were flowing into the magnetosphere. That's a 10 followed by 27 zeros. This kind of influx is an order of magnitude greater than what we thought was possible. The event began with little warning when a gentle gust of solar wind delivered a bundle of magnetic fields from the sun to Earth. Like an octopus wrapping its tentacles around a big clam, solar magnetic fields draped themselves around the magnetosphere and basically cracked it open. The cracking was accomplished by means of a process called magnetic reconnection. High above Earth's poles, solar and terrestrial magnetic fields linked up or reconnected to form conduits for solar wind. Conduits over the Arctic and Antarctic quickly expanded. Within minutes, they overlapped over Earth's equator, to create the biggest magnetic breach ever recorded by Earth-orbiting spacecraft. The size of the breach took researchers by surprise. We've seen things like this before, says Rader, but never on such a large scale. The entire day side of the magnetosphere was open to the solar wind. The circumstances of the breach were even more surprising. Space physicists have long believed that holes in Earth's magnetosphere open only in response to solar magnetic fields that point south. The Great Breach of June 2007, however, opened in response to a solar magnetic field that pointed north. To the layperson, this may sound like a quibble, but to a space physicist, it is almost seismic, says Seibeck. When I tell my colleagues, most react with skepticism, as if I'm trying to convince them that the sun rises in the west. Here is why they can't believe their ears. 
the solar wind presses against Earth's magnetosphere almost directly above the equator, where our planet's magnetic field points north. Suppose a bundle of solar magnetism comes along, and it points north too. The two fields should reinforce one another, strengthening Earth's magnetic defenses and slamming the door shut on the solar wind. In the language of space physics, a north-pointing solar magnetic field is called a northern IMF, and it is synonymous with shields up. So you can imagine our surprise when the northern IMF came along and shields went down instead, says Cybeck. This completely overturns our understanding of things. These northern IMF events don't actually trigger geomagnetic storms, notes Rader, but they do set the stage for storms by loading the magnetosphere with plasma. A loaded magnetosphere is primed for aurora borealis, power outages, and other disturbances that can result when, say, a coronal mass ejection hits. The years ahead could be especially lively. Rader explains, We're entering solar cycle 24. For reasons not fully understood, CMEs and even-numbered solar cycles, like 24, tend to hit Earth with a leading edge that is magnetized north. Such a CME should open a breach and load the magnetosphere with plasma just before the storm gets underway. It's the perfect sequence for a really big event and a grand display of northern lights. Cybeck agrees. This could result in stronger geomagnetic storms than we have seen in many years. Stay tuned to Science at NASA for more results from the Themis mission. This story was written and read by Tony Phillips. To find more Science at NASA stories on the Internet, please visit science.nasa.gov. Magnetic Portals Connect Earth to the Sun Presented by Science at NASA October 30, 2008 During the time it takes you to read this article, something will happen high overhead that until recently many scientists didn't believe in. A magnetic portal will open, linking Earth to the Sun 93 million miles away. Tons of high-energy particles may flow through the opening before it closes again, around the time you reach the end of the page. It's called a flux transfer event, or FTE, says space physicist David Seibeck of the Goddard Space Flight Center. Ten years ago, I was pretty sure they didn't exist, but now the evidence is incontrovertible. Indeed, today Seibeck is telling an international assembly of space physicists at the 2008 Plasma Workshop in Huntsville, Alabama, that flux transfer events are not only common, but possibly twice as common as anyone had ever imagined. Researchers have long known that the Earth and Sun must be connected. Earth's magnetosphere, the magnetic bubble that surrounds our planet, is filled with particles from the Sun that arrive via the solar wind and penetrate the planet's magnetic defenses. They enter by following magnetic field lines that can be traced from terra firma all the way back to the Sun's atmosphere. We used to think that connection was permanent and that solar wind could trickle into the near-Earth environment any time the wind was active, says Seibeck. Well, we were wrong. The connections are not steady at all. They are often brief, bursty, and very dynamic. Several speakers at the workshop have outlined how FTEs form. On the day side of Earth, that is, the side closest to the sun, Earth's magnetic field presses against the sun's magnetic field. Approximately every eight minutes, the two fields briefly merge or reconnect, forming a portal through which particles can flow. The portal takes the form of a magnetic cylinder about as wide as Earth. The European Space Agency's fleet of four cluster spacecraft and NASA's five Themis probes have flown through and surrounded these cylinders, measuring their dimensions and sensing particles that shoot through. They're for real, says Cybeck. Now that Cluster and Themis have directly sampled FTEs, theorists can use those measurements to simulate FTEs in their computers and predict how they might behave. Space physicist Jimmy Rader of the University of New Hampshire presented one such simulation at the workshop. He told his colleagues that the cylindrical portals tend to form above Earth's equator and then roll over Earth's winter pole. In December, FTEs roll over the North Pole. In July, they roll over the South Pole. Cybeck believes this is happening twice as often as previously thought. I think there are two varieties of FTEs, says Cybeck, active and passive. Active FTEs are magnetic cylinders that allow particles to flow through rather easily. They are important conduits of energy for Earth's magnetosphere. 
Passive FTEs, on the other hand, are magnetic cylinders that offer more resistance. Their internal structure does not admit such an easy flow of particles and fields. Seibeck has calculated the properties of passive FTEs, and he is encouraging his colleagues to hunt for signs of them in data from Themis and Cluster. Passive FTEs may not be very important, but until we know more about them, we can't be sure. There are many unanswered questions. Why do the portals form every eight minutes? How do magnetic fields inside the cylinder twist and coil? We're doing some pretty heavy thinking about this at the workshop, says Seibeck. Meanwhile, high above your head, a new portal is opening, connecting your planet to the sun. This story was written and read by Tony Phillips and presented by Science at NASA. To find more Science at NASA stories on the internet, please visit science.nasa.gov.